and thank you for tuning in from throughout Newfoundland and Labrador and across the country. My name is Cassidy McCain. I'm the Human Relations Manager with the Department of Health and Community Services. I will be your moderator for today. For today's event, we are joined by Premier Dwight Ball, the Honorable John Hagee, Minister of Health and Community Services, and Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, the Promises, Province's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Premier Ball, I now call on you to address the Congress.
please stand by. Our speakers will be here momentarily. Good evening, everyone, and I want to welcome you to the, uh, the update today. Uh, we will begin by asking the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, to give us an update on the overnight uh, results. Good afternoon, and thank you for connecting with us. Uh, today, I would like to advise that we have 15 new presumptive positive cases of COVID-19 in Newfoundland and Labrador. Of these cases, one is in the Central Health Region and 14 are in the Eastern Health Region. The Central Health case is linked to the previously reported case in Central Health Region. Of those in Eastern Health Region, eight cases are linked to a previous case. Two were travel related. All other cases are still under investigation and public health has initiated contact tracing. This brings our total number of cases to 24 in this province. Four have been confirmed positive by the National Microbiology Laboratory. <clears throat> 20 are presumptive positive cases. As of today, we have tested 938 people. You will note this number is smaller than yesterday. However, a small number of uh, people were tested more than once, so you'll see a, a dip in the numbers there. Of these 938 people, 914 people have been confirmed negative for the virus COVID-19. I understand that people are anxious, in particular if they attended a gathering where a person is now considered to be a presumed positive for the virus COVID-19. 
I want to clarify for those who believe they may have been in contact with a person who is a presumed positive for COVID-19 and are asymptomatic that you are not required to call Healthline. <clears throat> if you are concerned, you can go to the website gov.nl.ca and do the online assessment. If you are asymptomatic and live with someone who is self-isolating and does not have symptoms, you do not have to self-isolate. The risk uh, that came from the travel is the biggest risk for, uh, for that person and the risk for transmission will, is highest when that person becomes symptomatic. Public health is doing its job. They will contact everyone who needs to be tested due to the con contact with any person who is presumed positive for COVID-19. A reminder to everyone that if you call 811, please stay on the line until your call is answered. If you hang up and call back, your call will not be answered any quicker. Your call will go to the end of the queue in that situation. We have never before experienced a situation like this. While the cases in our province to date have been mild and the people have been recovering at home, the impact of COVID-19 is having around the globe is devastating. I must stress the urgency of what I am saying. We must act together. The time is now. Our actions today will dictate our situation going forward. We must act together to reduce our risk for our family, for our friends, and for our community. Self-isolation is mandatory for travelers returning to the province. There are some exemptions and for these you can check the website. You must adhere to the principles of social distancing. The actions you take have an impact. Wash your hands regularly. Practice good cough and sneeze etiquette. Stay at home unless it is essential to go out. Effective immediately, I am ordering additional business closures. Personal service establishments, including spas, aesthetic services, hair salons, body piercing, tattooing, and tanning salons. Retail stores, unless those stores provide services essential to the life, health, or personal safety of individuals and animals. Exemptions include stores that sell food, pharmaceutical products, medicine and medical devices, personal hygiene products, cleaning products, baby and child care products, gas stations, hardware stores, computer and cell phone service and repair, electronic and office supplies, and pet and animal supplies. Restaurants are ordered to close in-person dining. Takeout delivery and drive through services are permitted. Effective immediately, I am also prohibiting gatherings of more than 10 people. I know this is difficult, but funerals, wakes, and weddings must be limited to no more than 10 people. Visitation to personal care homes is also prohibited unless for exceptional circumstances, including end of life. A full list will be available on our website at gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19. <coughs> we are putting these public health measures in place to protect the health of our province. Our increased case numbers require us to take immediate action. We are actively considering further actions to reduce our risk. I am speaking to all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. It has never been more urgent to do your part to follow these measures. How we behave now will determine the impact this virus will have on us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. <clears throat> We are at a critical point in our province. We can see the number of positive cases increase. This is a critical point for Newfoundland and Labrador. I want to remind everyone who is watching this afternoon that we are in a state of emergency. Since March the 18th, I just want to clarify that. Some people have been asking questions. This is a public health state of emergency. And with this emergency in place, it still baffles me that we are still hearing stories of people getting off planes and not going straight home. Rather, we're still hearing stories of people who go to coffee shops to pick up groceries. This is wrong. If you are doing this, you are being completely irresponsible and putting people's lives at risk. 
and putting your own life at risk. This is not an example of community leadership. There are little ones around you. There are teenagers around you. They look up to you and they follow in your footsteps. What we need is for everyone to display responsible and safe actions. Now, if you know of an individual or business that is not adhering to the public health emergency order, there is an online public report form available on your COVID-19 website. You can now fill this report in online. This is not a cautious yellow light. This is a bright red light. We are asking for people to be responsible in their actions. Now, we've had a large number of public reporting coming in already. It is fair to say that some of you will be receiving a call from law enforcement. Now, today we might sound like an alarmist, but this is extremely serious. We are not talking about containing the spread. This could be the life of a loved one. Now, with that in mind, as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, the difficult decision to close long-term care homes province-wide to visitors. Now, this directive goes into effect at the end of regular visiting hours today. These, as I said, are difficult decisions. As we all know that this is an emotional time for many, but it is the right decision. It's the right decision for our loved ones. This action is to protect the most vulnerable population some of them with a weakened immune systems or underlying medical conditions. These are people who are at a higher risk of developing complications of COVID-19. Now we recognize family visits provide an important social connections and improvements for quality of life for many residents and for many of their families. Some of you may feel frustrated, sad, or even anger in light of this change. I understand your frustration. But we must stick to, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, our first principles. We must keep in mind that during this global pandemic, the health and wellness of all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, especially those who may be more vulnerable to such diseases, but also mindful of their families and our healthcare staff, these are our priorities. Also today, we are putting into effect a number of new restrictions, as Dr. Fitzgerald has mentioned, Lim limiting gatherings of 10 people. Of course, this could impact gatherings like weddings. And I know many of you have been working hard on planning for their very special day. But we're putting those measures in place so that you can have a life ever after. As we mentioned, funerals now limited to fend to 10 family members only. Once again, this is difficult, but we know how people interact very differently in those funeral settings. Limiting cab companies to two passengers per vehicle. These can have an impact. However, provisions will be made for those who require accessible transportation. Personal services, as been mentioned, are already closed. And starting today, we also have health professionals on site at the three points of entry into our province. And these professionals will, dis will do the distribution of forms for people which will outline the necessary steps for self-isolation. -isolation. Now these health professionals will be stationed at the airports in St. John's and Happy Valley Goose, Bay. Goose Bay. These are the entrance by airport to our province, but also to the ferry terminal at Marine Atlantic. They will also have some equipment to support individuals as they disembark and enter our province. Our government, along with our health officials, will take every measure that is required. But we need all of you, we need every resident of this province to follow the guidelines that we are setting. Most importantly, to practice safe social distancing. This means staying home only going out for essential services and then limit those visits to the grocery store, to the pharmacies. Just limit them wherever possible. You can also use online services 
online services that have been set up by government and some businesses in our communities. Do not visit others. Continue to wash your hands often. If you do not self-isolate, this means you cannot leave your home or come in contact with others. So I should say, if you are in, if you are self-isolating, you cannot leave your home or come in contact with others. So stay home in a separate room and use a separate bathroom, bathroom where possible. If you want to go outside to get some fresh air, which is understandable, do so in your own yard without contacting others. We have put additional supports in because of the large volume of 811 on our health line. If you have concerns about issues raising as a result of you or your loved ones being in self-isolation, a range of supports are also available by calling the Red Cross helpline. There is a large volume of calls on 811. The Red Cross helpline is there to help reduce that volume. This service is available to all residents and visitors in Newfoundland and Labrador impacted by the direction to self-isolate to limit the transmission of COVID-19. The Red Cross call line is 1-800-863-6582. So we recognize that this is a difficult and yet an emotional for many of you. We're working with the federal government. Our government continues to put supports in place to help you through this. We must all remember we can stay connected with family and friends by picking up the phone or by using video to call family and friends. Staying connected through technology is a great way to check in on your loved ones to see how they're doing. So we can come together as a province by keeping a safe distance. It's by following these rules that we will come out on the other side of COVID-19. We also know that there's a lot of information being shared on social media. If you have questions or concerns, we ask you to please visit our website at gov.nl COVID-19. Our website has the latest and has the most up-to-date information, which includes COVID-19, a self-assessment tool. And Dr. Fitzgerald just talked about that. It's a good tool to keep you updated where you are in your own circumstances related to COVID-19. So I cannot stress enough, we are at a critical point in our province as we've seen the number of positive cases increase. We are in a public health state of emergency. We can take the necessary measures that we, that we need and think necessary to, to decrease, to delay and contain the spread of COVID-19. We will not put people's lives at risk. We're not, only take, we're not only talking about containing the spread, there's lives at risk. So as our chief medical officer said, the time is now, be responsible. Thank you. I now turn it over to Dr. Agee for some comments. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Premier. Last week, when uh, we declared a state of emergency, a public health emergency, the first one ever in this province, uh, I think the uh, emotional temperature of the province went up. People were nervous and frightened, uh, and there may even have been some elements of panic in certain areas. And one of the things I know from my own experience is when that happens, people find it very difficult to think clearly and process so what I'm going to say now might be a bit counterintuitive, but you need to take a deep breath and then reconsider what it is that you need to know about your situation. We have, as the Premier said, a range of trusted information sources. And for heaven's sake, please look at those rather than Facebook or rather than Twitter or TikTok, because I cannot guarantee the validity of any of those. We have for those people who are concerned about their health status, a self-assessment tool. It's accessible through any of our websites and it gives you the same information and the same output that you would get for talking to 811 for that purpose. Should you feel, however, that you do have some symptoms that you need, feel need evaluating, may not necessarily be related to COVID-19, 811 is there for you. There are registered nurses available there 
and they can talk you through whatever your challenges might be. If you have a travel or an exposure history, mention it to them. Obviously, if you or your loved one is particularly sick and you are really concerned, 911 is always there for you and always has been. But again, if you're concerned about exposure, if you're concerned about travel, you should mention that so our first responders can be appropriately prepared. 811 at the moment is challenged as a line because there are a large number of people ringing in wanting sick notes. You will not get a sick note through 811. You cannot get a sick note through 811. And if you are a government employee, you do not need a sick note from any source if you have respiratory symptoms for 14 days as a minimum. I would ask people to bear this in mind and help take the load off a valuable resource. Premier and uh, Dr. Fitzgerald referenced those people who have traveled and are for various reasons in self-isolation. That presents some challenges. For people living alone, it may be as simple as how do I get my groceries? The Red Cross line that the Premier has referenced is there to help you with those things. It is there as a valued and trusted source of information. And the Canadian Red Cross has stepped up over the years and over the century, uh, providing this kind of service to Canadians and Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. They are there for you should you need them. For travelers, uh, as the Premier referenced, those people disembarking from planes or from the ferry coming out of the province will have access now to accurate information about how to go home and get home safely while still adhering to the principles of self-isolation. We've talked about social distancing, but really I think that may be a bit of a, uh, an inappropriate word. We've talked about physical distancing. We really need people to remain socially connected. That is the true fabric of Newfoundland and Labrador. That is what we're famous for. The difference now is you can't do it with a hug or a handshake. You do it with Facebook and you do it from six feet away or for the sailors amongst you, a fathom. For those of you uh, who have been looking at the numbers, you can see that the numbers are climbing. None of the individuals so far have required more treatment than can be available at home. The healthcare system, the regional health authorities and our acute care facilities, however, are ready and are prepared to deal with anybody who may need further assistance who requires hospital services. I spoke on previous occasions about challenges with uh, personal protective equipment. I've spoken with Minister Haidu about this, and she has assured me that she will do everything she can to make sure our needs are met. I've spoken with local business leaders uh, and uh, logistics people who have also offered their services at no charge to government to access um, necessary PPE. So there are means of dealing with some of these challenges up front. There will be more challenges to come. As everyone here has said, this is the beginning. The time is now. Please take this seriously. Thank you. We will now take questions from reporters, and I would like to remind the CEO of the Minister of Disaster that we have 12 reporters who are on the line. Thank you. <coughs> We will now take questions from the telephone line. Once again, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to ask a question. And if you are using a speakerphone, please lift your hands up before making your selection. Our first question is from Marie-Isabelle Rochon with Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, I talked to a person who came back yesterday from international travel at the St. John Airport. Uh, the person was not screened by health official, was not asked to fill any form about their, their symptom or to give their contact information. Uh, the person was only given a paper with information uh, by a health official. The measure, the measure regarding the screening and the new form to fill for international and out-of-province traveler were announced last Friday. How come those measures have not been 
put in place right away on Friday or on Saturday? Well, number one, we, as I mentioned on Friday of last week, that we would take uh, a few days to get the forms printed when the announcement was made. These forms were not readily available. We had to make sure that they would get printed, get people trained to actually be at the airports. Uh, that was on Friday, so this is Monday, so we've been able to act, you know, uh, very swiftly to get those people in place. And so at the uh, St. John's Airport, and at Happy Valley Goose Bay, and at the uh, Ferry Terminal now in Marine Atlantic, we have uh, resources there to, and information to give to people when they arrive to Newfoundland and Labrador. It's important now we get the public message out that if you come to Newfoundland and Labrador, regardless of uh, if you're coming from an international destination, if you've mentioned, but also from another province, you must self-isolate for 14 days. And how come, um, sorry, can I go back again? Yes, how many people uh, came back this weekend? Do we know how many people from out of province and from international travel came in Newfoundland this weekend without being screened? I wouldn't know the numbers offhand, how many people would have come into the province, but I know examples of there were flights that would have come into St. John's as an example uh, that had Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that would have come in. So the decision that would have been made to bring them directly into Newfoundland and Labrador, that would have been their final destination rather than have some of uh, our residents exposed to uh, uh, let's say an airport in Toronto, uh, that we would bring them directly to Newfoundland and Labrador because this was their final destination, this was their home, these are people that were coming home from international travel. Thank you. Our next question is from Peter Cohen with CBC. Please go ahead. In announcing the, uh, that there are no longer visitors allowed in long-term care centers, this is going to have a really big impact, as you acknowledged, on uh, a lot of seniors who may not have any other meaningful personal contact. What's being done to try and facilitate either phone calls, FaceTime, for some people who may not have the technological skills to be able to do it themselves? That's an excellent question, Peter, and I'll, I'll start with a, a very tangible example. Bonnie's Lodge uh, up in uh, Badger's Key, New Wes Valley, uh, they are arranging FaceTime sessions for their residents uh, with family members. Uh, there are a lot of these things that are opportunities now for long-term care facilities to engage in. And I think you'll see things like that become very widespread as this uh, um, pandemic uh, uh, continues uh, into the weeks and months ahead. And Peter, um, and just to build on that for, you know, for a comment, as you know, just yesterday we talked about the impact on visitors and family members being able to visit their loved ones in long-term care sites. You know, but it's, you know, things are changing and we recognize that they are the most vulnerable to a large extent of people in our society. And we know from the history of what's been happening across the world globally is that uh, we need to protect our seniors, we need to protect our, our most vulnerable. So the decision, you're right, is a difficult one. But as the minister said, is there are various ways that we can help to support our, our residents and let them connect in a very different way, which is very different to them as well. We understand that. But protecting our staff, protecting our families, and protecting the most vulnerable in our society is a priority for us as we make this difficult decision today. As a follow-up, there are also people in palliative care. I was talking to one family who has been told only one family member is allowed to visit um, their dying loved one. So this woman's children, for example, aren't even allowed to go and visit her and say goodbye. Why not allow more access for people who are dying, who quite frankly, COVID-19 is the least of their worries right now? The challenge there, Peter, again, it, it is a very sensitive issue. It's a very emotional issue. The challenge really is around the facilities and simply the volume of people that would come through, particularly in Newfoundland and Labrador, where there is such a tradition of large families. Uh, I feel particularly sorry for those with kin in Alberta, for example, because they are simply not going to be able to get there at all in person. Now, they may only have one person at a time, but those people can be rotated uh, with due care and attention to the issue of numbers. It is a risk management uh, issue. It's a risk management scenario. There is no decision that's perfect, and there is no decision that's going to make everybody happy. But on the basis of risk at the moment, 
this seems to be the safest one for the largest number of people. Thank you. Our next question is from Ben Murphy with BOCM News. Please go ahead. Minister Hagee, hearing from people who are working on the front lines, they're saying there is a major supply issue with personal protective equipment for public health nurses within community health. Um, again, we're hearing these frontline workers, they're very stressed and starting to refuse to go into homes. What do you say to that? Well, several things, uh, uh, Ben. We have addressed the supply chain issue. Uh, we certainly have um, our regular supply orders coming and we have increments. And uh, as I said, the extra orders uh, didn't seem to have flowed the way I'd anticipated, but I spoke to Minister Haidu yesterday. I've also spoken to other sources that will be able to provide that in the near future. But we have found potentially now uh, for a significant portion of the province other ways of um, providing the testing, for example, by public health staff with uh, less, um, uh, less use of PPE. So these uh, drive-throughs allow for the bulk of the PPE an individual would wear to be reused from case to case and only certain items changed between cases. And as those pick up and get rolling, uh, the demand on the PPE will ease a little bit and there'll be a better match between supply and demand. And Dr. Fitzgerald, now with 15 more cases popping up today, you said yesterday that it would have to get to a certain point before you would start releasing information on where some of these cases are popping up. Uh, with only two of these related to travel right now, is now the time to start releasing some of this information with places like Calls Funeral Home coming out and saying that they've had people infected? So um, at the moment, uh, you know, we have released that the, the people are in Eastern, uh, that uh, the number of cases that were in Eastern and Central. Uh, at the moment, we're not, the investigation is ongoing. Uh, so we won't be releasing any further information that could potentially identify individuals at this time. However, if there was information that needed to be released uh, for public health and safety, we would do that. Could I just chip in here? I think it's really important that in a sense... I'm sorry. Um, to reply to that last question, the challenge I think here, really and honestly, is the only safe assumption for anyone in this province is your next-door neighbour has this virus. You have been potentially exposed to this virus and behave accordingly it really is not going to serve anyone's purpose by people thinking, oh, well, it's only in that community down the road, so I don't have to worry, or it's next to me, uh, and I'm going to isolate and, and blame someone for the fact they become sick. Uh, those are not helpful responses. The only safe, responsible approach to this is to assume that it is not safe to go out and that you need to go out only for those things without which you cannot manage to, to make do over the course of the next few weeks. Thank you. Our next question is from Kelly Ann Roberts with NTV News. Please go ahead. Following on what Ben Murphy just said, we're seeing uh, several social media posts regarding Canada Post workers being sent home, having an employee there test positive. Uh, can you speak to this and what will be done, one, for the mail, and if this is in fact true and those workers have been sent home and are being tested? I've, uh, we've, we're aware of the situation at Canada Post. I mean, at this point, it's, uh, we, I guess to speak to the details and the specifics around what's happening there and the response by Canada Post, I understand that they've uh, taken uh, some measures which could include, you know, suspension of mail and so on. Uh, but right now, uh, we're aware of the situation. We are monitoring this, and we are working with Canada Post. Uh, just a few minutes before coming here, uh, there was some contact that's been made. Uh, so the specifics around the, the responses and so on is that Canada Post has respond, and they're taking the necessary steps uh, that is required in this situation. As we work through this ever-evolving situation, the Liberal leadership race has now been suspended. Premier, your thoughts on this and having to stay longer to help the province through this time? I'm not thinking about the Liberal leadership. <laughs> Quite frankly, I'm, as I said last week, I'm not concerned about the future of the Liberal Party. This is about the future 
of our province. And just going back to a comment that's been made by the minister, when we talk about you know the movement of this this virus, this virus has moved around the world in short order. It's moving around our communities, and the priority for me, and I can assure you, from the minister and from the chief medical officer and the group that I'm working with, this is our number one priority. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not concerned about those things that are occurring in other areas of the province. This is our number one priority. And I will be here, as I said last week, to lead this province through uh, to, every, to the best of my ability, as I know my colleagues will also be uh, during this current crisis in our province. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from Patrick Butler. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, I'm just wondering, other provinces have talked about the number of, of uh, uh, tests that they've, that they've uh, done where they're still waiting for the results to come in. Could you um, tell us the number of, of people who have been tested but for whom you don't have results yet? Uh, so the, those would be um, just people that have been tested uh, today, actually, so I don't have uh, those exact numbers, but once the lab gets the report, um, for the most part, uh, within 24 hours, we have the report back um, to know if they're a confirmed negative or presumptive positive. Uh, so there are, it's only the number of people that have been tested perhaps in the last 24 hours that we don't have those results back yet. And let's keep in mind, okay. we've, we're at a critical stage here you know, in the province right now, that those presumptive negatives, they, they are now confirmed negatives because it really takes from the, the analysis of this, and I know the minister and I, we chat quite often about this, is once you get to a number uh, that the quality control and the confidence within the testing has reached a certain point, we're there uh, with, the, with the negative test, hoping not to get there with the positive test, but we've moved it, uh, we've moved the numbers quite a bit today which is unfortunate, but uh, the testing, I will say, that it's, it has been very responsive in our province. And uh, as I said, the, the, t the negative tests right now are confirmed really because of the numbers that we've been able to do within the province. Um, and, and the other question I want to ask, in, you know, we, we talked a bit about social distancing. Um, I just want to make sure I understand completely, uh, you know, how the goalpost has changed on this. Um, you know, for people thinking about, you know, going for a run outside or, or, or doing things on their own but outside of their homes, I mean, it, has, has the sort of uh, the advice on things like that changed? How exactly are we, are we treating uh, social distancing today versus uh, how you were advising people to do it last week? So the rules are still the same. If you are home uh, and uh, you have no symptoms of COVID-19, and uh, if you, uh, you know, obviously stay at home unless for East, don't go to any other buildings or businesses or anything like that unless um, at all. Uh, but if you want to go um, outside uh, for a walk, uh, for a run, snowshoe, uh, whatever the case, uh, then you can do so as long as you respect um, the rules of physical distancing that we have uh, recommended, so two meters. Um, staying away from people and uh, just making sure, you know, uh, that you avoid uh, uh, touching objects as much as possible, wash your hands well, all of, those, uh, all of those things. If you have symptoms, however, you have to stay inside. Thank you. The next question is from Anthony Germain from CBC Television. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for making yourselves uh, available uh, once again. Um, we've seen uh, happen in other jurisdictions, and now today, uh, who would have thought that Newfoundland, Labrador, or whatever, tell people they shouldn't get together in more in groups larger than 10. So my question is, uh, isn't it time to consider shutting down our airports completely to all but the most urgent travel and set up quarantine centers? It's all good. And it's all fair and good to offer people forms and say you should do this, you should do that. But at some point, um, should this remain voluntary, or should you take that kind of action? I mean, we are surrounded by water. There's an island advantage that we hear spoken about. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, the immediate thought on that, Anthony, would be the fact that the you know, people coming in from another province, which was some of the most uh, you know proactive measures that were taken by any province we've seen other provinces now taking similar action. We took these measures a few days ago. 
So closing up those airports, uh, which is bringing people in internationally and from another province, and they're then required, they're now required to self-isolate for 14 days, it sends a strong message about when you visit our province from outside of Newfoundland and Labrador or from an another country, this is a requirement. However, from time to time, there is essential people and, and essential services that would need to come into our province. As an example, through Marine Atlantic now, there's, there's some firm restrictions uh, that it must be food, it must be essential items that people in Newfoundland and Labrador would need. So essentially, through Marine Atlantic and, and through our, uh, our airports, we've cut ourselves off from the rest of the world as much as possible, uh, but it's literally impossible to do it uh, you know, in every single circumstance. Just having three entry points, really two by airports in Happy Valley Goose Bay and here in St. John's and by Marine, uh, by Marine Atlantic in Port Abast and North Sydney. These are extreme measures never taken, uh, to my knowledge, in the province before. We've not yet seen a situation either where we would want to restrict travel within the province between Labrador and, and Newfoundland. Uh, and we need to uh, have mechanisms in place to allow that to happen. Uh, at the moment, uh, we don't feel, on the advice of the medical officers of health, there's any need to close down travel between, uh, you know, Gander and St. John's or, or, or St. John's and Goose Bay or Goose Bay and Cartwright. Whether that would come, uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but certainly it's one of those things that we check on uh, and is part of our daily risk analysis. And um, it's a permitted second question for Dr. Fitzgerald. I'd, I'd like something clarified with respect to what I've been able to research with respect to uh, people who, are, who aren't demonstrating any symptoms. So for asymptomatic patients or people who carry this illness, my understanding is that as we've learned more about this virus, that the big problem the world is facing is that the transmission does occur before there are symptoms. And I'm just wondering if you can clarify, because I think there's a bit of confusion out there. So that question has been brought up, uh, you know, it's been brought up since probably for a couple of months now. Uh, the evidence is not strong to support that and uh, certainly more needs to be done. Um, there is uh, some suggestion that that may be the case. However, what we know about that, this disease is that for the most part with respect to viral loads and with respect to transmissibility, it's certainly uh, the main driver is symptomatic people. Thank you. The next question is from Peter Cohen from CBC. Please go ahead. I, I, I've heard uh, some discussion around 3D printing, for example, the 3D printers that exist in schools uh, in this province, um, and they're being either collected up or at least inventoried. <coughs> What's the hope that you'll be able to use these 3D printers for? I think that's a very interesting question, Peter. We've had a lot of contact from the academic community, uh, as much from uh, the Faculty of Medicine and, and Engineering and, and Science faculties as any. Um, I'm certain to, certainly open to the idea of using any technology that will help us uh, slow or contain the spread of this disease. 3D printers are a tool. What is it you would like to manufacture, I think, is the question. And what is it that we're short of we can't get any other way? but I'm sure that there is a, a really um, excited and interested community of 3D printers who would be happy to help us should we ever find ourselves able to answer that question. And as a follow-up question, uh, you've talked about St. John's and Happy Valley Goose Bay. My understanding is there are still flights uh, into Labrador West that are coming in from outside of the province. So why isn't that one of the areas where there are health officials that are greeting passengers. Yeah, so what the requirement is in, in Labrador West, as we explained, uh, you know, last week, this would be some workers that would come from, you know, some sites in, in the Quebec side. And so the provisions that have been put in place for that area is that they would come in, you know, typically through bus, they would go directly to the airport and then, or directly to the tarmac onto an airplane, which would be a charter which, uh, with social distancing or as as John's been saying now, physical dis distancing uh, within the airplane. So the provisions made within the, uh, uh, with, with the airlines, I understand some of them are even putting nurses on board. So really to uh, not have, uh, not have uh, contact you know, through the airport facility. So this coming from the mine site, travel from the mine site to the tarmac, to the charter, onto your final destination. 
Thank you. The next question is from Kellyanne Roberts from NTV News. Please go ahead. Looking to clarify, uh, companies in Alberta have released information to their employees. A uh, company, for example, CNRL, an oil company, is telling their employees when they return back to the province they don't have to self-quarantine because of exemptions put in place. Can you clarify this? Bad information by that company, and I've talked to many uh, employees already. We've been very clear on what the requirement is from anyone entering our province from a, an oil installation in Alberta or elsewhere. If you come to Newfoundland and Labrador from another province or an international destination, when you come to our province, 14 days self-isolation is a requirement. Thank you. And uh, this one's for Minister Hagee. We talk about increasing uh, health staff at the entry points of the province, adding more lines to 811, bringing in more ventilators. Do we have enough staff? To support this? Are we looking at bringing those who have recently retired back into the field? Um, we look at our risk profile on a regular basis and certainly daily to see what the demand is. So far we have been fortunate that no one has yet required hospital admission. We therefore at the moment feel that our resources are, are certainly able to respond uh, and deal with uh, the, the short term. In terms of the specific you asked about retired staff, uh, we have worked with the College of Physicians and Surgeons and have a process whereby, in actual fact, recently retired physicians could be, in actual fact, uh, re-licensed re over the phone. We have an arrangement with the Newfoundland and Labrador Medical Association that physicians who might not normally, normally work in inpatient settings or in emergency room settings would come and be prepared to help out should the demand be in that area. We have worked with the uh, Health Professionals Council, for example. I mentioned respiratory therapists yesterday. Uh, they are another area. Uh, these are folk who look after ventilators and are the, the, the technicians, if you like, who have that skill and expertise. So we've been working to see uh, what uh, resources we could pull from recently retired folk. Similarly with the College of Registered Nurses in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, and the, uh, the practical nurses uh, regulator. So, uh, yes, we, we're, we're on that. Uh, we don't need to pull the trigger on that yet. If we do, we have a mechanism to do it. Thank you. The next question is from Peter Jackson from The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, I think we need a better uh, operator system given the uh, proportion of questions here. But anyway... My uh, question is to Dr. Fitzgerald. Can you confirm for sure that uh, none of the 25 local cases uh, were transmitted by a carrier that was asymptomatic? Um, at this time, the investigations, as you can imagine, uh, you know, 15 of these cases have come in since late last evening. Um, so I don't have all of the information uh, from the cases uh, of the last 24 hours. But the... Um, uh, up until this point, um, there was uh, the patients who have contracted the disease have done so through travel um, or through contact with someone who was symptomatic. Um, I can't speak to the exposure of the travel, uh, you know, what the person was exposed to while they were traveling, except to say that it was travel exposure. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Um and that is, uh, we've heard recently that a mine in Central is still operating. They have quite possibly 50-plus people working in close quarters. Is that, does that follow your guidelines for workers in this province? Didn't get the confidence. No. It was a, a mine in Central that was still working. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, Peter, couldn't get the first part of your question. Uh, so what I understand is what you're talking about, a mine in central Newfoundland that would have uh, probably an, empl an employee contingent of somewhere around 50 people. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, yes. so the response there would be, you know, through we have inspectors with uh, occupational health and safety that, you know, would go to those sites. Why can we have examples even today of having inspectors on sites to make sure that those, uh, that those companies, the ones that are still in operation, are doing so respecting the provisions that we put in place 
through the various orders that the chief medical, medical officer has recommended. So there is an expectation that we keep the work, uh, the work site safe. I spoke to contractors this morning that are making, uh, that are making provisions and making uh, adaptation on the work site to make sure that you know, people add the social distancing that's required, uh, the personal hygiene products that are, that are required. And if we find ourselves with an, with an employer you know, that's not compliant, well, we will do the right thing and that's shut it down. I would like to remind reporters that there are 12 of you on the line and some people aren't getting an opportunity to ask questions. We've had reporters who have already asked multiple questions. So please be respectful of your colleagues and so we can get questions from the other reporters. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Ben Murphy from BOCM News. Please go ahead. Um, Premier, just further to that last question, Trace and L is also speaking out this morning about work at construction sites, particularly Munn's core science facility, and that's continuing. Um, when are we just going to see a concrete ruling around the construction industry? Well, some some contractors, as you might expect now, as you know, would be you know doing, putting in measures to uh, for the ad adaptation of the certain work sites. As I said, inspectors are on site. You know, and they visit those those sites regularly to make sure that they are in compliant. If we find ourselves in a situation where they've not been able to be compliant, well, we will make the decisions that are required to protect workers. Uh, things like social distancing, making uh, making provisions around equipment, personal hygiene, as I've just mentioned. So that is the work of occupational health and safety, and they will be, you know, checking on those sites. And it's important that we must remember that, you know, in some cases, work would continue for those contractors that are able to uh, put in the proper, the appropriate measures that's required to make sure the workplace is safety, uh, is safe. But really, when they're not compliant, well, we will make the decision to protect Newfoundlanders and Labradorians on those sites. And wondering about any programs in place for sports organizations who are also taking a big hit here during all this. Uh, they also have thin margins and are quite essential to the community and when they're going to be pretty heavily relied upon when things get back to normal. Um, are there any programs in place? Yeah, there are some programs in place. Uh, some of them will be federal measures and some will be provincial measures and we recognize, I think our society, our province recognizes, the world recognizes that these are indeed uh, unusual times and we've had to make some tough decisions. We recognize that and we recognize the impact that it would have on organizations like you just mentioned. We have nonprofit organizations that are impacted. We have many businesses that are impacted. Employees are impacted. So we will put in place programs to support those that are negatively impacted by decisions that we make as a province and the decisions that are made by the federal government. Thank you. The next question is from Drew Brown from The Independent. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, um, I was just looking to get a little bit of clarification um, on some of the new numbers announced today. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe one of the statements was that one positive case um, was sort of connected to eight other positive cases, and I was just looking for clarification on whether that particular case was symptomatic at the time, or if you can clarify how that happened. Um, so, there were eight cases that were linked to another positive case. Again, that investigation is ongoing at the moment, so I don't have all the details uh, with regard to that. But my understanding is that there were symptomatic people um, in, in that uh, group of eight. I think the message here, as the Chief Medical Officer just mentioned, when you just look at the tracking and the tracing, the difficulty sometimes when people are, are, you know, are just not being compliant with the recommendations, and that's not to suggest that this is the case but the recommendation that we're putting out there is for people to be mindful of each other's health and that if they are not doing the appropriate <coughs> thing, that then they could have a huge impact. When you look at the story today uh, and the, the number of people that are impacted by potentially one person, this is what happens. This is what happens with this virus. This is why it's spread around the world and spreading throughout communities in this location here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So we're simply asking people to do the right thing and be responsible. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Holly McKenzie Sutter from Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. I know there's a meeting or a call tonight with the Prime Minister. I'm wondering if the Premier can 
elaborate on what you're going to bring up in that conversation and any particular ask from Ms. Robin? You know, the call will be yes tonight with the Prime Minister and my, my colleagues across the country, which is these are regular calls that are occurring just like I think the Minister as well with his, with his colleagues and of uh, health ministers across the province as well. And we're seeing uh, the public safety. There will be a, a federal call as well with, with that group. So there's a considerable amount of uh, federal provincial collaboration uh, across, happening across our country right now. So much of the call will be around COVID-19, some federal legislation and so on. There will be uh, discussions around the economic impacts. How do we, you know, where are the benefits, you know, for our employees here in Newfoundland and Labrador and for residents of our province. So we'll, we expect this will be a long call. Uh, but, you know, for me, it'll be making sure that as a province, you know, we're taking all the necessary <laughs> steps supported by the federal government as well. But keeping in mind as we come through COVID-19, we must, you know, uh, we must be uh, making provision for when we get through this, that coming out the other end, the programs are in place to support people in our province when we come through this, but also as we go through this. So much of the call will be on those, uh, on those, uh, those, uh, those items. Okay, thank you. And the uh, second question would be, I'm looking for a bit more clarity on the role of police in enforcing the public health emergency orders. You mentioned today that some people will be getting calls from police about these companies, but I'm wondering if you could go through just kind of whether these will be warning calls or actual fines being issued or um, if you're, and if possible, any fines yeah. that have been issued already. So the public, uh, the public reporting has been, been busy. Uh, there's no question that people are sending in uh, complaints. Uh, they will be followed up on, as the minister mentioned yesterday, some work with the uh, Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, the RNC. And so right now, if uh, we leave that in the hands of our law enforcers, but most importantly, there's one way to prevent any of those calls, and that's be compliant, be responsible, so that your neighbor or your friend or some of us working with you in the workplace do not have to file that complaint. But I'll assure you that uh, uh, these, uh, these complaints are coming in, as I mentioned, they can now be done online, and we'll then be turning them over to the RNC, as the minister mentioned yesterday. All of this, is to protect the people in, in our province and to make sure we put in the strictest uh, health and safety measures possible. And there are consequences. And you know, to those, there's fines, as the minister has mentioned already. I guess those numbers are online. But there are consequences to bad behavior as a result of, uh, as a result of the, these uh, public reporting forms. Thank you. I would like to return the meeting to Ms. Kathy dix -Payton. Please go ahead. Do we have any further questions from reporters? I know that we do have Elizabeth Witten on the line, Evan Kareen, and Barb Sweet. Do you have any questions for the media? None of those participants are registered to, take, to ask questions. Okay, well we can go through a second round of questions then. Perfect. The first question will be from Mr. Peter Cohen from CBC. Please go ahead. The decisions that you guys are making are literally can be life and death. Uh, some of these decisions that you're making around closing businesses are going to have big financial consequences. How much do you lie awake at night and wonder whether or not you're finding that right balance between trying to protect people's health and trying to be able to keep the economy going? Peter. Uh as you know, I've had, a, uh, I've had to deal with quite a few challenges in, in the last five years as, as Premier of this province, but nothing like this. Uh, this is very different, and there's without question, you know, the, the burden, you know, that we all share at this table and people that work with us is, is a very heavy one, uh, without question, because you're right. This is not about the health and, uh, and, and life and death of individuals within our province as we take these, these measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, but we also recognize that, you know, that the employees out there, when it comes to uh, uh, compensation and businesses that have been already through a difficult 2020 in our province, yeah, we do worry about that, and we take, and we will do whatever it takes as a province and working with the federal government and my colleagues through all departments that we have, whatever resources that we have available to us, we will took, we will put to the number one priority today, which is to protect. Uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, but also mindful that coming out of this and going through this, 
We must support those that have been impacted financially as well, and we'll be taking the necessary steps. I come from a background where uh, I had one patient at a time, uh, and that was hard enough some days. I've got, I think, 522,000 now, so I have no idea what Dr. Fitzgerald's going through, really. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult, Peter, it really is. But at the end of the day, you look at the evidence, because that's all you can rely on. You need to have some science, and Dr. Fitzgerald and her small but mighty team have made a very good job of staying awake for long hours, providing us with that information so we can make the best decisions on the information we have at the time we have to make them. And then at some point in the future, history will mark us and grade us. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Marie-Isabelle Rochant from Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Yes, so uh, we learned today from uh, Quebec newspaper Le Devoir that uh, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada is currently holding an online public consultation regarding the elimination of the uh, environmental assessment for all offshore oil and gas exploratory drilling. Uh, they are not suspending those consultations even with COVID-19 going on right now. I know it's a federal decision, but do you think that the federal government should suspend those public consultations until the COVID-19 crisis is over? Yeah, I think if I could pick up your question, it was coming in a bits and pieces there. Um, so what I, I think what, I, what you're referring to was what's happening offshore with exploration. And if that's the case, uh, go ahead. With the public consultation going on, uh, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada not suspending their public consultation. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure where, what stage that is uh, with, the, with the public consultations. Uh, that is not something I know I've been working with the Minister Cody, and I'll get some information for you on that. I know in terms of the safety of the rig workers uh, that, are up there, that are working offshore right now, I know there's a considerable amount of work with the, uh, with the Chief Safety Officer and with the Department and with CNLOPB uh, CNL and with the companies to make sure that those workers are safe. But the exact uh, where we are with public consultations around the regional assessment, I don't have that information with me today, but uh, we can get that for you. Well, um, I'm telling you right now that the, the uh, agency will want to send their public consultation. So my question to you is, I know it's a federal decision, but do you think that the agency should suspend those public consultations? I think it's appropriate that you consider the where this province is and the uh, what is the priority for what is on front and center, what is on the minds of, of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. The, the regional assessment is important to the future of Newfoundland and Labrador, but for the very present, the consultations that I'm in, involved in will be around health care and COVID-19 in our province. What the federal government would de decide to do with their public consultations, I would ask is to respect where we are with this priority situation with people in our province. Thank you. The next question is from Anthony Germain from CBC Television. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, Premier, you made uh, reference to the fact that you're speaking with the Prime Minister uh, tonight, and I, I'm wondering, is, um, is there a possibility that the federal government is going to help us uh, with a cash flow crunch by doing borrowing uh, on our behalf? Well, on Thursday of this week, Anthony, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we'll be bringing to the House of Assembly a, a loan bill. So this gives us the authority, to, with the support of uh, members in the House of Assembly, and I've spoken to my, my colleagues, and I know the House leaders have been was speaking about this, it would give us the authority to go out and, and borrow. We all know that it's very difficult times, not just for Newfoundland and Labrador, by the way, but any province that's you know, connected to natural resource development as we are. We know the, uh, what's happening with oil prices. We know what's happening in, in most natural resource developments now in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, so I've been, you know, speaking quite openly with the, with the federal government on the current situation that we are in, but we're not in this alone. Other provinces will find themselves in a, di a very difficult situation. We are just at a different spot in, as we start. Uh, as you know, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and other provinces would be in a different spot 
uh, our our GDP, our debt to GDP was in a mu was much different than, than theirs, and our debt load was much different. So we'll have the discussions with whoever the responsible, uh, you know, partners would be in all of this to make sure that we're in a position to pay the bills for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. And just the last question for this whole uh, offering is that, not to sound not effective, but I think talking to people, there's a, there's a great sense of comfort and seeing you, Premier Ball, up to uh, I think really appreciate this, and uh, I know it can't be easy for you, and I'm not quite sure coming up with Peter's to keep in, so I, I know it's really appreciated. So rather point that any of by this, as has happened in other countries, what's what's the backup? So, so Anthony, yeah, Anthony, I think... Uh, from on this end, uh, we got about a third of that question, so I'm well, not. I, I'm sorry about that. I didn't. We only picked up bits and pe pieces of your well, question. Okay, so um, I'm basically saying that you were, these briefings are providing a lot of comfort to people, and you, all three of you, become the face of this situation in Newfoundland and Labrador, this unprecedented situation. And my question is, in the event that any of you, particularly. Okay, I think what you're asking, I think what you're asking if, if something should happen to one of us as we become the spokespeople for today. We've got a tremendous, you know, group of people that we work with as well. Uh, you know, right now I think we're all feeling good from what I'm told. Uh, mm -hmm. I, know, uh, I, know the min I know the minister's up quite early in the morning and up quite late at night because we have lots of conversations and I know Dr. Fitzgerald, who was, you know, fairly new to, you know, these, these things have been very open and very candid and, the, you know, the feedback that I'm getting has been very positive and the great work that, you know, that Dr. Fitzgerald's been doing for all Newfoundland and Labrador. So we're feeling good, uh, but, you know, you never know in life, uh, you know, where the certainty is. But I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting COVID-19 behind us as a province and getting, you know, us as a, in a situation to become healthier as residents of, of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I'll do whatever it takes in the future for me, and I'm sure all of us will, to make sure that we secure the future of the, the, ec uh, the economy in our province as well. So uh, right now, I can only speak as I feel today, but we're feeling pretty good. And even though we don't like the message, we don't like what we have to do today, it's, it is tough. They are tough times for our province, but we'll continue to do the best with what we have available to us. Thank you. The next question is from Elizabeth Whitten from All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Hi there. I'm wondering what changed between now and yesterday to make the decision to close long-term care facilities to visitors? Because from what I heard over the weekend, I was listening in, it sounded like it was that it wasn't quite going. It wasn't quite there yet. So I'm wondering what changed. The passage of time and and events. We always had at the back of our mind that this was a likely outcome. I think the hope was we could delay it as long as possible if we couldn't avoid it. But I think to harken back to comments others have made, <clears throat> long-term care facilities house some of the most vulnerable uh, and physically weakest of our society. And I think if we uh, don't learn the lessons of other jurisdictions, uh, we're condemned to repeat the problems they've had. And hard as it has been, uh, it, it's the right thing to do on the basis of what Dr. Fitzgerald and her team have recommended. I think the reason we didn't do it before was quite simply the, the level of upset and distress it would cause, because this is not going to be something we will be able to lift, in my opinion, for weeks, if not months. And as we said, if you look back at, you know, the country, even last Friday, it's a little over a week ago to where we are today, it's a very different country. Mm -hmm. So these things are very fluid. They evolve quickly. And as we've heard Dr. Fitzgerald speak many times, it's really sometimes not on a daily basis. It's on an hourly basis that we're seeing significant changes uh, within, within our province. So in light of that, these are difficult decisions, and we... Uh, uh, difficult to make because we know they have an impact on families and, and are most vulnerable. But yet we have to make those decisions, you know, to protect our staff and to protect our most vulnerable. I understand Evan Kareem from Labrador Voice is trying to get on the line to ask a question. If we could expedite that, that would be great, operator. Certainly. Mr. 
Mr. Kareem. Please press star one at this time. Okay, if he's not there, we'll continue. Thank you. My next question is from Peter Jackson from The Telegram. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, whether any uh, nurses, uh, we've heard that it's quite possible nurses in the Northern Peninsula and Bonavista area may actually be going back to work after travel without quarantining because of the urgent need of their services. Is there any, uh, is there any word on this uh, from any of your sources? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. From what I'm aware of, that has uh, not occurred. Um, certainly we would go back and check, but our instructions to the RHAs have been that staff should comply uh, with the, the requirements under both federal and provincial recommendations that were in force at the time they returned. Now, you may recall that there was a sea change in those instructions uh, just over 10 days ago, uh, whereby the requirement to self-monitor was replaced with a requirement to self-isolate for overseas travel. Uh, and then since then, we've actually added the requirement to self-isolate for anyone returning from outside a province. But we have given direction to the RHAs that this should be monitored uh, from an HR perspective, and we expect compliance. Okay, and the other question is, uh, we have a, uh, a, a large number of frontline workers, including nurses. I understand that the unions have been in consultations as recently as today on how to handle daycare for this. It's been in discussion for some time. Is there any uh, site, any site of uh, a solution to that on the horizon? Yeah, we need a solution. There, there's no question that uh, when we have essential workers that you know, we're asking to support the initiatives that we're putting in place and in preparation, you know, we're, uh, for the future of what could happen, you know, in, in our institution. So it's important that we have the resources available. Even from a family, there's, there's stresses that we know. Uh, so we're working. I know I spoke to the Minister of War, you know, quite a few times already today, and I know there's planning under, undergoing, uh, ongoing, you know, within that department now to get a solution so that we can put a plan in place to support uh, the essential workers uh, within our province. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Holly McKenzie Sutter from Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to confirm, because uh, it wasn't quite clear in my first question about police, if there have been any, uh, any enforcement or any fines related to these public health emergency orders. The, uh, that the matter of fines would be one for, for the courts, but my understanding is that uh, given the nature of our ramp up over the weekend, we we're only just getting to the point where now we have some um, reliable information uh, and the RNC are, are starting to process that. So uh, the answer to the question is no, and that's the background to it. Okay, and a quick follow-up on that, too. So in terms of where you get this reliable information from, is there a, a broad list right now of, you know, people who should be self-isolating? For example, anybody who comes off a plane, if I get off a plane today, am I now on a list where if my neighbor were to file a complaint through this system, then that would be flagged as a legitimate complaint and I could be phone by police. I guess, could you give a broader sense of where this like database is coming from? Well, the, the reliable information I was referring to was in terms of what was provided in terms of complaints, because over the course of the last few days, it's really been the, you know, I've seen somebody who looks very tanned walking down the street and going into a grocery store. Shouldn't they be at home? And none of that really is even investigatable, if that's a word, or, or actionable. Uh, in terms of data supplied by, um, you know, travel uh, authorities or the federal authorities, uh, we have had intermittent success in getting that data from, uh, from them. Uh, I know that in the past we did get a list from 
one of the uh, pre uh, federal sources of cruise passengers. Uh, but we are working through our department with, um, with federal groups to see if we can uh, bring that to some more kind of organized and regular way, but we haven't got there yet. Thank you. The next question is from Evan Kervin from Southline Network. Please go ahead. Hello. Um, building on an earlier question about the location, uh, information about the locations of identified cases, um, in recent years, the Health Authority has named communities, hospitals, and locations in Labrador and on the island with tuberculosis cases. So in terms of privacy, how is this any different? Uh, actually, if you go back, it's a good point, and I think it's one that's led to some confusion in the minds of members of the general public. That information was not released by the Department of Health or Labrador Grenfell uh, or any of the other regional health authorities. It was actually released by other parties, uh, and we declined to comment any further. Uh, obviously, in the situation where resources are sought to go to particular communities by other um, uh, government agencies uh, outside of the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, that itself then becomes a, a matter of public interest. But again, it, it's people uh, joining dots that, uh, that we don't provide. Okay, because I'm, I'm as a follow-up to that, I am, I'm currently looking at a Labrador Central Health press release from 2017 um, that identifies the hospital in St. Anthony where a tuberculosis case, case was identified. Okay, I'll take that under advisement and have a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions. I'd like to return the meeting to Ms. Kathy Dix-Payton. Please go ahead. I would just like to give one more call for questions from the media, and uh, once we have done that, we will conclude the news conference for the day. If you have any further questions, you can email them to me, and I will get your answers. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Kellyanne Roberts from MTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Looking for, I know a release is coming later with what businesses are to close and that will be provided. Um, in terms of the fishery, we know the FFAW is to begin price negotiations next or this week. Uh, fishermen are worried about what this means in terms of COVID-19 and for their businesses. Yeah, so I spoke with the minister this morning on, on not only just fish, har fish harvesters and and pricing, but also on fish processors as we're coming up to that. This is the time of the year. Uh, so we're, you know, in discussions now with, you know, some of the uh, impacted individuals here. But this is a process in terms of price setting that's done by a board, uh, really exclusive of government there, to actually work with the harvesting sector uh, through the FFAW and with the, uh, uh, the uh, processors. And, you know, that's a process that occurs every year. We recognize that this is, as I've said so many times, very uh, <coughs> normal situations, unusual situations in our province, in every industry, including the fishery. So I would anticipate that those talks will continue, and hopefully they can get to a point where, uh, you know, they can reach a settlement. And if, uh, if indeed, because this is a situation where you really can't defer things, you know, uh, not being able to get out. And, uh, and actually fish, which, which is a part of our food security as well. It's important for not only the fish harvesters, but the processors and those that work in plant workers under very different circumstances this year, I'm sure. And uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, having seen a jump in cases overnight here now, are we expecting to see another jump over the coming days, knowing that this could be a result of um, previous two weeks, uh, not just let alone the past two days? Yes, so what we have to remember about these cases is that we found them through contact tracing. So this is what we're supposed to do. This is what public health is meant to do, is to find these cases um, and to uh, have them isolate. So the fact that we've seen this increase in cases, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is, um, you know, a, a, a larger number of cases uh, uh, 
widespread in our community, it means we have found cases that we know through contacts, uh, which most, uh, if not all of these are. As I said, some investigations are ongoing. Uh, we do expect, however, to see more cases um, as travelers have returned and as they move through their incubation periods and may develop symptoms, uh, it, we would not at all be surprised uh, to see a rise in cases over the next two weeks. Thank you. We have you. time for one more question, and then we will end the news conference. Thank you. The last question is from Ben Murphy from the OCM News. Please go ahead. Um, if you look down to the Facebook stream right now, almost every comment has something to do with the state of emergency. We've called a public health emergency, but not a state of emergency. Could you just clarify for people out there watching and listening the difference between the two and why you are not calling a state of emergency at this time? Um, we have seen those comments. I think a lot of this is around perception. We have a, the newest and most robust public health legislation in the country, and we have and have had now for nearly a week a public health state of emergency. There is nothing from a public health point of view that we need to do now, are doing, or foresee having to do that can't be done under our new piece of legislation. I'm not sure from those comments that there is any clarity in my mind of what it is that people out there think we should be doing that we're not doing that we can't do under our current state of emergency. So that is where my view is as Minister of Health if there are other non-health related issues that require a state of emergency that would not be my decision. I think some of the confusion Ben around this is what we're seeing in other provinces that would use you know different pieces of legislation it gets reported as a state of emergency within this province or some other province. We are able to and if you look at what other provinces are doing in, in implementing changes and recommendations for health protection in their province, we're taking some more aggressive steps than some of the other provinces are already. So we are able to do with this piece of legislation that the minister uh, and his group put in place just over a year or so ago in our province that every other province are doing, but they have to use a different piece of legislation. So this is not holding us back. This is not putting us in a situation where we are able to, to do less than some other province. We just have legislation in place our in our province through the measures that's been taken by the minister and indeed the uh, amendments that have been put in place by the chief medical officer that we were in a position where other provinces, you know, uh, you know, we're in a position where other provinces are. So if you compare us to, uh, you know, Atlantic provinces or in other areas that are put in so-called state of emergencies, we are there and in many cases ahead of them. We, we led the way because we had the ability under this act. It was well thought through, it was well crafted, and it's delivering on what its drafters intended to do. If at some point in the future there is something outside the realm of health that this act does not cover, that's when we'll certainly change tack. But we have a state of emergency. We have had since last week. It's simply that ours is done under one piece of legislation rather than the other jurisdictions having to use three or four. And Dr. Fitzgerald, um, you said today that asymptomatic individuals are not significant transmitters. Uh, I've had doctors reaching out to me almost immediately after saying that that's not the case. What do you say to them? So what I said was that it doesn't appear to be significant drivers of the, infect of the outbreak. So the majority of people who are contracting the disease are contracting it from people who are symptomatic. Um, so the, the information on asymptomatic transmission is evolving. It's evolving quickly, and uh, you know, if we get new information that changes the way we have to do things, then we will do that. Thank you very much. The time for questions has ended, and for all the reporters who are on the line who need to get questions in, if you could email me, that would be great. It's kathydickpayton at gov.nl.ca. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>